on C-SPAN 2. This is C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Next, oral argument from the landmark abortion case, Roe v. Wade. This case was argued before the Supreme Court on December 13, 1971. At the time, under Texas law, having or performing an abortion was illegal unless to save the life of the mother. Sarah Weddington argued for Roe, the Texas woman who sought an abortion. Texas Assistant Attorney General Jay Floyd represented the government. We'll hear arguments in number 18, uh, Roe against uh, Wade. Mrs. Weddington, you may proceed whenever you're ready. May it please the court. The instant case is a direct appeal from a decision of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Texas. The court declared the Texas abortion law to be unconstitutional for two reasons. First, that the law was impermissibly vague, and second, that it violated a woman's right to determine to continue or terminate a pregnancy. Although the court granted declaratory relief, the court denied appellant's request for injunctive relief. The Texas law in question permits abortions to be performed only in instances where it is for the purpose of saving the life of the woman. The case originated with the filing of two separate complaints, the first being filed on behalf of Jane Roe, an unmarried pregnant girl, and the second being filed on behalf of Jane and Mary Doe, a married couple. Jane Rowe, the pregnant woman, had gone to several Dallas physicians seeking an abortion, but had been refused care because of the Texas law. She filed suit on behalf of herself and all those women who have in the past, at that present time, or in the future, would seek termination of a pregnancy. In her affidavit, she did state some of the reasons that she desired an abortion at the time she sought one, but contrary to the contentions of Apolli, she continued to desire the abortion, and it was not only at the time she sought the abortion that her desire was to terminate the pregnancy. When this case was in the district court, uh, the uh, case of Vujic against the United States had not been decided here. That's correct. Now that's just, uh, do you think that has disposed of some of the questions raised now? Your Honor, I do not. In the Vujic decision, this court was working with a statute which provided that an abortion could be performed for reasons of health or life. Our Texas statute provides an abortion only where it is, ne where it is for the purpose of saving the life of the woman. Since the Vujic decision was rendered, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which is our highest court of criminal jurisdiction, has held that the Texas law is not vague, citing the Vujic decision, but saying that the Texas law is more definite than the D.C. law. So obviously the Court of Criminal Appeals doesn't feel that the two are the same. And in the, the Vujic decision, the justices of this court emphasized continuously that a doctor, as a matter of routine, works with the problem of what is best for the health of his patients. We submit that a doctor is not used to being restricted to acting only when it's for the purpose of saving the life of the woman, and that health is a continuum which runs into life, and a doctor in our state does not know whether he can perform an abortion only when, when death is imminent or when the woman's life would be shortened, he does not know if uh, the death must be certain or if it could be an increase in probability of her death. So here in the district, doctors are able 
to exercise their normal matter of judgment, whether or not the health of a woman, mental or physical, would be affected. But in Texas, we tell a doctor that unless he can decide whether it's necessary for the purpose of saving her life and for no other reason, that he is subject to criminal sanction. I think it's important to note the range of problems that could be presented to a doctor. The court, for example, uh, cited the instance of suicide. If a woman comes in alleging that she will commit suicide, is it then necessary for him to do or can he do an abortion for the purpose of saving her life? Or is that a situation where he has to have something more? I, I think all of those questions cannot be answered at this point. This brings up the married couple in our case. The woman in that case had a neurochemical condition. Her doctor had advised her not to get pregnant and not to take the birth control pill. She was using alternative means of birth control, but she and her husband were fearful that she would become pregnant and that although the neurochemical condition would impair her health, there was evidently her doctor did not feel that she would die if, if she continued the pregnancy. And certainly they were very concerned about the effect of the statute and her physician seemed uncertain about its implications. The doctors in our state continue to feel that our law is vague. Uh, certainly we introduced affidavits in the lower court to that effect. Since the time of the lower court ruling, uh, the district attorney in Texas has said that he will that he considers the federal court decision there not to be binding, and he is. Uh, and we do have a letter from him in the first thing in our uh, appendix to the brief, stating that he will continue to prosecute. So the doctors in Texas, even with the federal decision and even after the Vuitch decision, do not feel free to perform abortions. And instead, 728 women in the first nine months after the decision went to New York for an abortion. Texas women are coming here. It's so often the poor and the disadvantaged in Texas who are not able to escape the effect of the law. But certainly there are many Texas women who are affected because our doctors still feel uncertain about the impact of the law, even in light of the Bluich decision. Well, and then, of course, uh, Mrs. Wellington, you make uh, many additional constitutional attacks upon the Texas statute, and only one was before us uh, in the Bluich Yes, Your Honor, only we the, Only the claim of unconstitutional vagueness, and uh, the court explicitly didn't uh, reach Did any of the other it. claims, and you make many other claims. But of course, before you get to any of those, there are good many threshold questions, are there not? Of yes, Your Honor, there procedure. are. I think it's, of course, important to point out to the court that in my reading of Younger versus Harris and the, ca the companion cases, all the court was concerned about in those cases was a situation where there was an attempt to interfere with a pending state criminal prosecution. In this case, as I pointed out, the original parties to this uh, matter are women, and in one case, a husband. The women certainly are not subject to prosecution in the state of Texas. They are, it is impossible for them to stand in the criminal dock and litigate their interests. They came seeking injunctive relief, but it was not against pending state criminal prosecution. They were not even aware of the prosecution against Dr. Halford. Could they, could they under Texas law be charged as uh, accomplices or no, your as Honor, co-conspirators or anything like that? No, we have expressed Texas cases. In one situation, Woodrow versus State, an 1880 case, the woman had taken a potion uh, to induce abortion, and the Texas court specifically said that the woman is guilty of no crime, even in that situation, and that in fact she is the victim of our law. She can't, there is no declaratory relief available for these plaintiffs. Their only forum was the federal court, and it was to those courts that they turned. Your three plaintiffs here, representing classes, I gather, were yes, sir. one, an unmarried pregnant woman, yes, two, sir. a married couple. Oh, yes. Uh, and the doctor was shown that it would be injurious to the wife's health to have a child, and also injurious to her health to use the most efficient form of birth control. Yes. And then third is a physician. 
yes, who is under indictment or yes. was at the time of this complaint. The ph physician intervened after the order was entered granting Jane Roe a three-judge court. And he intervened again, asking only that future prosecution under the law be enjoined. He did not ask any relief of the court relating to his pending state criminal prosecution. He did specifically in his complaint reserve the right to ask for future relief, but that was never done. And certainly in the future, if he were to ask for relief, the court would have the uh, guidance of the Younger versus Harris companion cases. But there was in no way any request for any uh, action to interfere with the pending criminal prosecution then in process. As to, uh, there is uh, an allegation that the question is moot since the woman has now had, has carried the pregnancy to term. And I think it is, imp it is important to realize uh, that there are several important aspects in which this case differs from the case that the courts might usually be presented. First, the case is different in the nature of the interest which is involved and in the extent to which personal determination is undermined by this statute, the effect that it has on women. Second, it is unique in the type of injury that's presented. Certainly there are some injuries that can be compensated and most last over a sufficient period of time for the courts to litigate the interest. But in this case, a progressing pregnancy does not suspend itself in order to give the time, uh, the courts time to act. Certainly Jane Roe brought her suit as soon as she knew she was pregnant, as soon as she had sought an abortion and been denied, she came to federal court. She came on behalf of a class of women, and I don't think there's any question but that women in Texas continue to desire abortions and to seek them out outside our state. There was an absence of any other uh, remedy, and without the ability to lift, litigate her claim as a pregnant woman who came seeking relief and who's, whom was affected by the time required for the federal process, not, be, not because of any infirmity in her own <coughs> attempts to litigate her interests, that this will in fact be a case certainly presenting substantial federal question and yet evading review in the future. I think uh, the third way in which it is unique is, as I've stated, the fact that it is the only forum available to these women. Uh, they have no other way to litigate their interests. Does that mean that there is no possibility of getting a declaratory judgment under Texas law? Yes, Your Honor. Declaratory judgments in the state of Texas are limited to a situation where property rights are involved. And we also have a very unusual situation in Texas where we have two concurrent jurisdictions, one the civil and one the criminal. And it, even there are some cases which indicate that our state Supreme Court would not have the ability to mandamus any of the criminal prosecution officers because the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals has jurisdiction as to all criminal matters in the state of Texas. So even if the woman had been able to bring a declaratory judgment, which she couldn't, she couldn't have gotten any sort of relief against future prosecution. And it was exactly the absence of the court granting uh, an injunction against future prosecutions, which have resulted in the irreparable injuries these women have suffered. Uh, in Texas, the woman is the victim. Uh, the state cannot deny the effect that this law has on the women of Texas. Certainly there are problems regarding even the use of contraception. Uh, abortion now for a woman is safer than childbirth. In the absence of abortion or legal medically safe abortions, women often result to the illegal abortion, which certainly carry risks of death, all the side effects such as severe infection, permanent sterility, all the complications that result. And in fact, if the woman is unable to get either a legal abortion or an illegal abortion in our state, she can do a self-abortion, which is certainly perhaps by far the most dangerous, and that is no crime. She is, in our state, uh, The microphone won't uh, be effective. Excuse me, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, 
Texas, for example, does, it appears to us, would not allow any relief at all, even in situations where the mother uh, would suffer perhaps serious physical or mental harm. There's certainly a great question about it. Uh, if the pregnancy would result in the birth of a deformed or defective child, she has no relief. Regardless of the circumstances of conception, whether it was because of rape, incest, whether she is extremely immature, she has no relief. I think it's without question that pregnancy to a woman can completely disrupt her life, whether she's unmarried, whether she's pursuing an education, whether she's pursuing a career, whether she has family problems. All of the problems uh, of, of personal and family life for a woman are bound up in the problem of abortion. For example, in our state, there are many schools where a woman is forced to quit if she becomes pregnant. In the city of Austin, that is true. A woman, if she becomes pregnant and is in high school, must resign or must drop out of regular educa the regular education process, and that's true of some uh, colleges in our state. In the matter of, of uh, employment, she often is forced to quit at an early point in her pregnancy. She has no provision for maternity leave. She has, she, uh, cannot get unemployment compensation under our laws because the law holds that she is not eligible for em employment being pregnant and therefore is eligible for no unemployment compensation. At the same time, she can get no welfare to help her at a time when she has no unemployment compensation and she's not eligible for any help in getting a job to provide for herself. There is no duty for employers to rehire women if they must drop out to carry a pregnancy to term. And of course, this is especially hard on the many women in Texas who are heads of their own households and must provide for their already existing children. And obviously, the responsibility of raising a child is a most serious one, and the time and emotional investment that must be made cannot be denied. So a pregnancy to a woman is perhaps one of the most determinative aspects of her life. It disrupts her, her body, it disrupts her education, it disrupts her employment, and it often disrupts her entire family life. And we feel that because of the impact on the woman, this certainly, in as far as there are, are any rights which are fundamental, is a matter which is of such fundamental and basic concern to the woman involved that she should be allowed to make the choice as to whether to continue or to terminate her pregnancy. I think the question is equally serious for the physicians of our state. They are seeking to practice medicine in what they consider the highest method of practice. We have affidavits in the back of our brief from each of the heads of public, of heads of obstetrics and gynecology departments from each of our public medical schools in Texas. And each of them points out that they were willing and interested to immediately begin to formulate methods of providing care and services for women who are pregnant and who do not desire to continue the pregnancy. They were stopped cold in their efforts, even with the declaratory judgment, because of the DA's position that they would continue to prosecute. Mr. Lennington, so far on the merits, you told us about the important impact of this law and its made a very eloquent policy argument against it. I trust you are going to get to uh, what provisions of the Constitution you rely on, because, of course, we're, very we'd like to sometimes, we cannot here be, be involved simply with matters of policy, as you know. Your Honor, in the lower court, as I'm sure you're aware, the court held that the right to determine whether or not to continue a pregnancy rested upon the Ninth Amendment, which, of course, reserves those rights not specifically enumerated to the government, to the people. I think it is important to note uh, in a law review article recently submitted to the court and uh, uh, distributed among counsel by Professor Cyril Means, Jr., entitled The Phoenix of Abortional uh, Freedom, that at the time the Constitution was adopted, there was no common law prohibition against abortion, that they were available to the women of this country. Certainly
certainly under the Griswold decision, it appears that the members of the court in that case were obviously divided as to the specific constitutional framework of the right which they held to exist in the Griswold decision. I'm a little reluctant to uh, aspire to a wisdom that the court did not was not in agreement on. I do feel that it is that the Ninth Amendment is an appropriate place for the freedom to rest. I think the Fourteenth Amendment is equally an appropriate place under the rights of persons to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think in as far as liberty is meaningful, that liberty to these women would mean liberty from being forced to continue the unwanted pregnancy. You're, you're relying in this branch of your argument simply on the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment? We had originally brought the suit alleging both the Due Process Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, the Ninth Amendment, and a variety of others. Since and anything the, else that might have been. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, uh, since the district court found the right to reside in the Ninth Amendment, we pointed our attention in the brief to that particular aspect of the Constitution. But I think we would not presume. Uh, I, I do feel that, that in so much as members of the court had said that the Ninth Amendment applies to rights reserved to the people and those which were most important, and certainly this is, that the Ninth Amendment is the appropriate place. Insofar as the court has said that, uh, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness involve the very most fundamental things of people, that this matter is one of those most fundamental matters. I think in as far as the court has said that there is a penumbra that exists uh, to encompass the entire uh, purpose of the Constitution, that I think one of the purposes of the Constitution was to guarantee to the individual the right to determine the course of their own lives, insofar as there was perhaps no compelling state interest, and we allege there is none in this case, that there again uh, the right fits within the framework of the previous decisions of this court. What is the asserted state interest? Does the, is there any legislative history about this statute? No, sir, Your Honor. Uh, no, sir, there is not. Uh, the only legislative history, of course, is that which is found in other states. Uh, which has been pointed out to the court before, and Professor Means points out again that these statutes were adopted for the health of the mother. Certainly the Texas courts have referred to the woman as being the victim, and they have never referred to anyone else as being the victim. Uh, times have, have certainly changed. I think it's important to, to realize that in Texas, self-abortion is no crime. The woman is guilty of no crime, even though she seeks out the doctor, even though she consents, even though she participates, even though she pays for the procedure. She, again, is guilty of no crime whatsoever. It's also interesting that our statute, uh, the penalty for the offense of abortion depends on whether or not the consent of the woman was obtained prior to the procedure. It's double if you don't get her consent. Uh, there is... Uh, no indication in Fondren versus State, for example, the court ruled that a woman who commits an abortion on herself is guilty of no crime. Again, she being regarded as the victim rather than the perpetrator of the crime. Obviously, it's in our state, the offense is not murder. It is an abortion, which carries a significantly lesser offense. Uh, there is no requirement of even though the state in its brief points out the development of the fetus at an eight-week period, the same state does not require any death certificate or any formalities of birth. That the products of such a conception would be handled merely as a pathological specimen. And the statute doesn't make any distinction uh, based upon uh, at what uh, period of pregnancy the abortion is performed. No, Your Honor. Uh, there is no time limit or indication of time whatsoever. So. I think... Well, do you make any distinction? No, sir, I, I do. I feel that the question of a time limit is not strictly before the court because of the nature of the, the situation in which the case is uh, handled. Certainly, I think it's a practical matter, though. Most of the states that do have some 
time limit indicated still permit abortions beyond the time limit for specified reasons, usually again where the health of the mother is involved. What's, what's your constitutional position there? As to a time limit? What about uh, whatever clause of the Constitution you rest on, the Ninth Amendment, due process, uh, uh, the general pattern, the numbers? It is our uh, position... Will that take you right up to the time of birth? It is our position that the freedom involved is that of a woman to determine whether or not to continue a pregnancy. Obviously, I have a much more difficult time uh, saying that the state has no interest in late pregnancy. Why? Why is that? I think it's more the emotional response to a late pregnancy rather than it is any uh, uh, constitutional. By whom? Um, I guess by persons considering the issue outside the legal context. I think as far as the well, state... Do you, do you or don't you say that the, uh, the constitutional uh, I would say the right constitu you insist yes. on uh, reaches uh, up to the time of birth? Or the, the Constitution, as I read it and as interpreted and documented by Professor Means, attaches protection to the person at the time of birth. Those persons born are citizens. Uh, the enumeration clause. We count those people who are born. The Constitution, as I see it, gives protections to people after birth. Mr. Twitty, can I ask? Uh, the, the issue here, I guess, on your appeal, is whether you are entitled to injunctive relief. Yes, sir. Well, assuming that, uh, in all other respects, uh, your argument were accepted. Why do you think, in addition to declaratory relief, to entitle the injunctive relief? Those are different things, aren't they? Yes, sir. Uh, certainly, in your dissent, you point out in Perez versus Ledesma's concurring dissenting opinion. That you, was a dissent. Sir. It was a dissent thing. Uh, that there are different standards which apply to the declaratory judgment and to injunctive relief. Well, I guess we said that in Switzerland before. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and that's what the court said, following Zwickler versus Cuda, that even though they were granting declaratory, uh, declaratory relief, that different considerations applied as to injunctive relief. But it seems that the opinions of this court have established that where there is, there is great and immediate threat of irreparable injury with no adequate remedy in state court, that an injunction is still proper. And it is our position that there is great and immediate threat of irreparable injury in the form of a continuing pregnancy that will not abate and that continues. Well, that so you're you're really a, uh, you're a, you're asserting that the the pregnant woman has standing yes, in this case, and the married couple uh, where the wife is not pregnant has standing. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, what about the doctor where? It's, where a criminal prosecution was already pending against him. The doctor, as I said, was asking no relief as to the pending prosecution. He was only asking relief as to future but he prosecution. Was asking for a declaratory judgment. Yes, Your Honor. He joined in both the request for the declaratory judgment. Well, didn't Younger against uh, Younger and the, the, the companion cases cover the declaratory judgment? Max Hell? Where, the, where there were pending, uh, where the, the Samuel versus Michael, as I read it, did say that where you have an, a request for declaratory judgment, there would be an effect on a pending criminal prosecution. There was one pending when this There was one pending when this action was brought, that one of doc those against Dr. Halford. However, in this case, we submit that if there is to be any meaning to the federal courts as the supreme arbiters of constitutional rights, that they must be able to act, at least in some form, when there are pending criminal prosecutions, not particularly against the person involved in the prosecution, well, but well, other cases have, but at least the federal courts may, but uh, court, uh, limited uh, the situation to the, the harassment where the prosecution uh, improperly is used as a device to harass the person prosecuting. Wasn't that it? Yes, Your Honor, but again, as I understood it... Uh, you're, you're, you're suggesting it ought to be broader than that? I'm suggesting that in this case, these, the women in particular brought a declaratory action having nothing to do with the pending state criminal well, prosecution. We talking now about and that the intervention of the doctor yeah. certainly should not be sufficient well, as to the... We're talking about the doctor's case. Right. Yeah. That, the, the that because the doctor intervened, 
when he was asking no, no relief as to the pending state criminal prosecution, that his intervention... You mean he was asking, no, he was asking what? No injunction against the continuance of that prosecution? That's correct. He, he is willing not, he to litigate his interest as to future prosecution. Well, except that he wanted a declaratory judgment, as I understand it. Yes, sir. The Your underlying Honor. statute on which yes. the prosecution was brought is unconstitutional. Isn't that it? Yes. Well, and I thought that's what Samuels and Michael said he couldn't have. And which your dissent said was incorrect. Well, I, I, I repeat that. <laughs> so it was a dissent. Okay. Uh, I think perhaps we would stress that there are two separate actions before the court. First, that of the women, and second, that of the doctor. So that even though the... Uh, even though the doctor... Uh, even though the court might find that the doctor was an inappropriate party for relief, it certainly would not affect the original action as brought by the women. All right, then I, and, come, I come back again. If, if we're left only with the, with the ladies' action, uh, you're suggesting that uh, the um, declaratory relief they already obtained is not enough because that doesn't help terminate the pregnancy. Because they are still uh, subject to the irreparable injury and have no adequate state remedy. And if, if they are not able to continue to litigate their interests in this situation, any time there was any prosecution pending against anyone in the state at any point in the appeal, for example, the Thompson case was filed in 1968. It's been decided now in our state courts. It's on appeal, or it will be appealed here, I think. And certainly, if, if they cannot litigate their interests while there's prosecution pending against the doctor, they will in many instances where a statute, where there's... Well, I suppose the answer is that uh, if, uh, there's prosecution against the doctor, uh, there's not going to be any doctor that's going to uh, be available, is that it? Yes, they, they cannot uh, even decide to take the risk for themselves under the declaratory judgment. They re must rely on another person to take that risk. But certainly the doctor raised not only his own rights, but the rights of his patients, and those same patients are suffering the same sort of irreparable injury that the original plaintiffs were suffering. Couldn't the doctor raise that same point in the criminal prosecution? Yes, Your Honor, he can, but I, I don't feel it's appropriate to make those women who are most vitally affected, certainly more so than the doctor, who can merely decide not to perform an abortion and thereby escape. I'm only talking about the doctor. You said there were two separate issues here. And the issue involving the doctor yes, is to sir. litigate everything he's now litigating in the state court. Yes, Your Honor. My point being that, that these women should not be compelled to leave it up to a doctor to litigate those things. Oh, uh, well, he's going to obviously defend himself in a criminal prosecution, isn't he? He didn't count on him to do that. Well, I think there are different interests involved. And, and in most criminal prosecutions, the doctors would bring up other uh, problems, such as I didn't do it or something like Yeah, that. the witnesses have disappeared, or it really was for this reason in this particular How, case. But uh, has, has this defense ever been interposed in a Texas criminal case? Yes, Your Honor. Defense? There is one recent opinion, Thompson versus the state of Texas, which the Attorney General uh, attempted to bring to the attention of the court, and it was not printed, and the court rejected it. But it was a decision about a month and a half ago, which originated in Houston. A doctor there was... Uh, indicted uh, on a charge of abortion. At trial, he used only an alibi defense. But on his appeal, he did raise the same constitutional questions that we raised in the federal court. The court and said that was too late? No, Your Honor, they, they could have, but they didn't. They went ahead and litigated those issues. And our Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which is our highest court, uh, has now held that the statute is not vague, citing Vuitch, which, again, I would contend is an incorrect reliance. That's the case you cited to the Chief Justice yes. in your argument. Yes, and second, that, there, that they specifically did not determine whether or not there was a right to privacy, but did hold there was a compelling interest. So in that particular situation, which is the only situation, a doctor did attempt to litigate the same issue. And the Texas issue. Court of Criminal Appeals has basically upheld the constitutionality the constitutional direct, uh, of the They statute. upheld really direct, directly in opposition to the federal court opinion from which we are appealing. That case can be They have filed a motion for rehearing in the State Court of Criminal Appeals, which will be argued tomorrow. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that the court would uh, change its opinion, and it is the intention of those parties to appeal. Uh, does Texas law 
in other areas of the law uh, give rights to unborn children in the areas of trusts and estates and wills or in no, the No, Your Honor, courts. only only if they are born alive. We have the Supreme Court of Texas recently has held in one case that there is an action for prenatal injuries at any stage prior to birth, but only upon the condition that it be born alive. The same is true of our property law. The child must be born alive. And I, I think there is a distinction between those children which are ultimately born, and I think it is appropriate to give them retroactive rights. But I think that's a completely different question from whether or not they had rights at the time they were still in what the about, womb. Uh, what about the uh, <clears throat> unborn child who is, uh, as a result of an accident, killed, or whatever word you want to use mm -hmm. for it? There has been no situation litigated like that in Texas. I suppose you noted that the what Iowa... about around the uh, country? Uh, the Iowa Supreme Court about uh, two weeks ago held that where it was stillborn, there was no... Uh, uh, cause of action whatsoever. The child and the mother, uh, for the mother. Or well, now, oh, I'm, I'm speaking, excuse me, solely for the fetus. That the fetus had no independent right. That the mother, the, the mother, the mother recovering on for the death of the child, or for the whatever you want. To only for her injury. And only for hers. Yes. Does that include anything with regard to the child? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Weddington, Mr. Floyd. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court. It's an old joke, but when I argue, a man argues against two beautiful ladies like this, they're going to have the last word. I, before I proceed to the original issue in this case, which was the propriety of the trial court uh, grant or denying injunctive relief, I would like to bring to the court's attention some grave matters concerning uh, what has been referred to as the standing of the parties. Uh, the couple involved, they were a married couple, a childless married couple. The only matter, evidence, or whatever in the record concerning uh, their contentions is contained in their first amended original petition. That is, that the woman would have difficulty if she became pregnant in carrying a child to childbirth. Further, that they were unprepared for parenthood. We submit to the court that their cause of action is strictly based upon conjecture. conjecture. Uh, will they continue the marriage? Will her health improve? Uh, will uh, the, they then be at some time in the future prepared or unprepared for, for parenthood? There is no fear of prosecution by Mary Doe. Uh, if we accept all contentions of these, this married couple, uh, we submit that they still do not come under the prescribed conditions of Flass versus Cohen and Golden versus Zwickler. We feel that the lower court properly denied them standing. As to the unmarried pregnant female, uh, a unique situation arises in is her action now moot? Of course, if moot, there is no case or controversy. It's a class action, I think. It was a class action. Surely you would, I suppose we could almost take judicial notice of the fact that there are at any given time uh, unmarried pregnant females in the state of Texas. Yes, Your Honor. I would say that the only thing that could uphold her uh, 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 her standing would be, or, or eliminate the mootness issue, would be whether or not this is a class action on her part. Yes, Your Honor. The record that came up to this court contains the amended petition of Jane Roe. An unsigned alias affidavit 
And that is all. She alleges that she was pregnant on April the 20th, 1970, which is some 21 months ago. Now, I think that it is, it has been recognized by the appellant's counsel that she is no longer pregnant. This court has consistently held that the time of determination of mootness is when the hearing is before the court. That is, a case can become moot from the hearing in the trial court until the time it reaches this court. We do not feel appellant's authority contained in their brief will substantiate their con her contention that the case is not moot. Uh, the, I, I might add this, that I, I believe the law to be that if there is a reasonable possibility of reoccurrence of the situation, then the case would not be moved. Now, this is the W.T. Grant case. Uh, the other case or cases concern orders of the Interstate Commerce Commission, which the court holds that there is a, a possibility or a reasonable possibility of continuation of those orders and the, the capability of repetition. It deals mainly with the capability of repetition. <coughs> we think the case of Jane Roe can be easily compared to Hall versus Beals. In that particular case, a group of voters instituted a class action uh, complaining of a Colorado statute which prescribed a residency requirement of six months. They had, at the time, lived in the state, for, or at the time of the election, were lived in the state some four or five months. The case came up through the lower courts of this court, and in the meantime, Colorado repealed the statute and established a two-month residency requirement. The election was held in the meantime. The trial court plaintiffs complained of the two months residency requirement. This court held the cause of action moot, even though it was denominated as a class action. But there's a big difference. Colorado had amended its statute, and Texas has not. That is correct, Your Honor. But the fact was that you still had, if it is what we want to call it, the, the evil still existing of two months. But it was the other statute that had been the subject of the litigation. And that yes, statute had been amended. I, I say there is. That's it's not, not true here. That's not what we call white horse, Your Honor. I understand. The, in, in connection with the, with the class action aspect of this, and I say I have no authority to support this proposition, but it would appear that in order for a class action to continue, if there be one to begin with, is that one plaintiff must remain or else an intervenor or someone to be a representative of a class. Because this is the whole purpose of the class action, to have a representative in court. <clears throat> now, the position of the appellate Halford, how do you suggest, uh, if you're right, uh, how do you, what, what procedure would you suggest for any pregnant female in the state of Texas ever to get any judicial consideration of this constitutional claim? Your Honor, let me answer your question with a statement, if I may. Okay. I do not believe it can be done. There are situations in which, of course, as the court knows, no remedy is provided. Now, I think she makes her choice prior to the time she becomes pregnant. That is the time of the choice. It's like more or less, uh, well, the first three or four years of her life, we don't remember anything. Uh, but once a child is born, a woman no longer has a choice, and I think pregnancy may terminate that choice as well. Maybe she makes her choice when she decides to live in Texas. <laughs> may I proceed? <laughs> the, 
we there's no restriction on moving. No. Your Honor, the, the appellant offered is under two indictments uh, charged with the or offense of performing an abortion. There are no allegations in in the complaint of appellant Halford or none in his affidavit that there is any bad faith uh, prosecution, bad faith uh, arrest, uh, 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 harassment of him at all to bring him within Dombrowski's special circumstances. We think the cases of Younger versus Harris and Samuels versus Michael are controlling as to Dr. Halford's position. We also feel like that Dr. Halford cannot rely upon his patient's rights to, to bring him into federal court. And I think the Tillotson versus Ullman case will, will uh, be authority for that proposition. As to the matter of injunctive relief, after a court once grants declaratory relief, uh, I, I will make this comment that it appears the court can consider the propriety of declaratory relief and can consider the propriety of injunctive relief. That is, the court can divorce the two. And once granting declaratory relief, that a statute is unconstitutional, uh, in its discretion can determine whether or not injunctive relief is proper and deny it, if it so feels. Now, should this court, as I understand it, and the, the, all of the parties feel that if this court once acquired jurisdiction of the matter, that the parties would like the court to consider all the constitutional issues. Uh, the well, are you, uh, are you uh, sustaining, uh, or, or are you saying that the uh, denial of injunction was proper because uh, the uh, declaratory judgment was there? No, Your Honor, I say the court can grant declaratory relief as an unconstitutionality and deny injunctive relief. Well, I know, but if, uh, if certainly if, 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 the erroneous, if the judgment about the, uh, um, if the declaratory judgment was erroneous, uh, it was also right to deny injunction and injunction. Yes, Your Honor. That's is, that, is that your position? That's correct. If the, I think if, they, if the court of course, uh, says... You didn't cross appeal. We have, have. We could not to this court, Your Honor. We have to go to the Fifth Circuit. So we have. But are you yeah. attempting to sustain the uh, denial of an injunction here on the grounds that the declaratory judgment was improper? We are, we are asking the court, testing the court to do this, that if the court gets into the merits of injunctive relief, whether or not it was proper, under the circumstances that this court go forward and continue the other, or continue the constitutional issues and make the determination of the Constitution. Can, can we do that? Yeah, you, you're in the Fifth Circuit because we said that you couldn't cross appeal from a declaratory judgment. You can only cross appeal from an injunct grant or denial of Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I, I suppose we could do it if we bypass the Court of Appeals and bring up uh, your appeal pending in the Fifth Circuit. No, no, we did. Couldn't we? Uh, you, you, you're here. Your opponent has brought a direct appeal here because your opponent yes, sir. was denied an injunction by the three-judge district court. Yes, sir. You could not bring in a cross appeal here <coughs> because uh, you won from the point of view of, uh, of successfully resisting the injunction. Yes, sir. But now that you're here as the appellee, you're arguing that an injunction should not have issued, and part of that argument uh, it very legitimately can be that on the merits, the court was wrong and that it shouldn't have issued a declaratory judgment or an injunction. That's correct, Your Honor. And that is your position? Yes, Your Honor. Now, the proceedings in the Fifth Circuit have been stayed or uh, abated. Well, I, 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 I must say, your, your position makes sense to me. But uh, don't some of our prior uh, cases rather foreclose it unless we bypass the, the circuit and bring your appeal pending there here? Well, your honor and i don't want to be repetitious but a motion has been filed in the fifth circuit to hold the appeal in abeyance until a determination yeah, by this you, court. you didn't ask you didn't file any motion here asking us to bring your appeal pending in the fifth circuit here for decision with this appeal did you no we have requested that in our 
in our uh, uh, reply to the jurisdiction and in our brief. We have presented it in that, that uh, manner. Your Honor, we feel that this court can or and should consider all issues and under the Sterling, the Florida Lime and Avocado Growers and the Carter cases which are cited in the briefs of the parties. <coughs> what is Texas interest in this statute? Uh, Mr. Justice, the Thompson case, which has been cited to the court, Thompson versus State, the Court of Criminal Appeals did not decide the issue of privacy. It was not before the court or the right of choice issue. The state, uh, the state court, the Court of Criminal Appeals held, held that the state had a compelling interest uh, because of the protection of fetal life, of, of fetal life protection. They recognized the humanness of the uh, embryo or the fetus. And they said, we have an interest in protecting a fetal life. Whether or not that was the original intent of the statute, I have no idea. And yet, the, and yet Texas does not attempt to punish a woman who um, herself performs an abortion on herself. That is correct, Your Honor. And the matter has been brought to my attention. Why not punish for murder since you are destroying what you or what has been said to be a human being. I don't know, uh, except that I will say this, as medical science progresses, maybe the law will progress along with it. Maybe at one time it could be possible, I suppose, the statute could be passed. Whether or not that would be constitutional or not. Well, I we're dealing with the statute as it is. There's no, there's no state is there that equates abortion with murder, or is there? There is none, Your Honor, except one of our statutes that if the if the mother dies, that the doctor shall be guilty of murder. But that's ordinary. Yes, it's felony murder. I would say so, Mr. Justice. Yes, the Texas statute covers the entire period of pregnancy. Yes, it does, Mr. Justice. Yes, sir. Mr. Floyd, is that Thompson case? I don't find that Thompson case cited in the teacher. I gather you said it just had been decided recently. Um, Mr. Justice, this case is just a recent case. Do you have a citation? Uh, it, is, it is not in the reporter system yet. Are you going to provide us with a copy of it? I'll be happy to, yes, sir. I'll provide the court with a copy of it. Well, you know. This is number 44070. C.W. Thompson versus the state of Texas. The opinion was delivered on uh, November the 2nd, 1971. I shall be happy to furnish uh, the court with this copy if the court so desires. At the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals. Yes, Your Honor. And I, now, and that's the case Mrs. Whittington told me is pending on re uh, motion for rehearing. Yes, Your Honor. Now, there's if one of that, uh, If you leave that with the clerk, Floyd, uh, we'll distribute copies here. Right. That, in addition, uh, the Thompson case uh, cited a uh, huge case in regard to vagueness and said that it was controlling the issue. And I, as I recall, Dr. Thompson raised the issue of, well, how can you find me guilty of murder, I mean of, of abortion, if you make no determination that the fetus is alive at the time I performed this, in effect, is what he's saying. He never admitted doing it, but he's saying, it, uh, how can you prove it? Well, of course, the Texas court answered by saying it is presumed the fetus is alive when an abortion is performed. You say the, in answer to my brother Marshall's question as to what is the interest of the state in this legislation, or even what is its purpose, what is its societal purpose, 
your answer was, I think, relying on your opinion of the most recent opinion of the Court of Criminal Appeals of Texas, that it was the protection of fetal life. And uh, then I think you also said that was perhaps not its original purpose. Well, I'm not sure of that. I well, it's, it may be rather important in a constitutional in a constitutional case of this kind. It becomes quite vital sometimes to rather precisely identify what the asserted interest of the state is. I think that original purpose, Mr. Justice, and the a present prevailing purpose may be the same in this respect. There have been statistics furnished uh, to this court uh, in various briefs from various groups and from uh, medical so societies uh, of different uh, of groups of physicians and, and um, gynecologists or whatever it may be. These statistics are, have not shown me, for instance, for example, that uh, abortion is safer than normal childbirth. They have not shown me that there are not emotional problems that are very important uh, uh, resulting from uh, an abortion. Uh, the protection of the mother at one time uh, may still be the primary, but the, the policy considerations, uh, Mr. Justice, would seem to me be for the, for the state legislature. To, to make a decision. Certainly that's true. Policy questions are for legislative and executive bodies, both in the state and federal government. But we have here a constitutional question, and uh, in deciding it, assessing it, it's important to know what the asserted interest of the state is in the enactment of this legislation. I am, and this is just from my, uh, I speak personally, may I for me. I would think that even when this statute was first uh, passed, there was some concern for the unborn fetus. When was it enacted? I believe it was 1859 was the original statute. This, I believe, was around 1900, 1907. It goes back, uh, it goes back middle, 50, middle of the 19th century. Yes, sir. Before that, there were no criminal abortion laws in Texas, were there? As far as I know, there were no. I, have not. I think this is maybe set out in some of the briefs. I... Well, in any event, Mr. Floyd, apart from your personal attitude, your court has spoken on the intent of the statute. Yes. Is it not? Yes. Well, I can't quite square that most recent pronouncement with the earlier decisions of the Texas court that refer to the mother as the victim. Can you? Well, uh, as I say, Your Honor, The, I, I don't think the courts have come to the conclusion that the unborn has full juristic ri uh, rights. Not, not, not yet. Maybe they will. I don't know. Uh, I just don't feel like they have at the present time. In the first few weeks of pregnancy? Sir? In the first few weeks of pregnancy? Uh, or at any time. Uh, Mr. Justice, we make uh, no distinction in our statute. Whether there's life there or not. We say there is life from the moment of impregnation. And do you have any scientific data to support that? Well, we begin, Mr. Justice, in our brief with the, the development of the human uh, embryo carrying it through to the development of the fetus from about seven to nine days after conception. Well, what about six days? We don't know. But the statute goes all the way back to one hour. I don't, uh, Mr. Justice, uh, it, there are unanswerable questions in this field. I, I, I appreciate it. This, is, this is an artless statement on my part. I withdraw the question. Thank you. <laughs> Or when does the soul come into the, the unborn, if a person believes in a soul? I don't know. <clears throat> I assume the appellants now are operating under 
the Ninth Amendment rights, there are allegations of First Amendment rights being violated. Uh, however, I, I feel no, there is no merit. This statute does not uh, establish any religion, nor does it prohibit anyone from uh, practicing or being a part of any religious group. Uh, I see no uh, merit in their contentions that it could possibly be under freedom of speech or press. In fact, there was been some articles recently in this city's newspaper yesterday, for instance, about it. The other constitutional rights that the appellant speaks of, I think, are expressed in two manners. The individual or marital right of privacy. And secondly, or, or the right to choose whether or not to abort a child. Now, uh, if, if, if the uh, does are out of the case, the, the marital privacy is, is out of the case. But be that as it may, neither individual nor marital privacy has been held to be absolute. We have legal search and seizure. We have the possession of illegal drugs. Uh, the practice of polygamy and other matters. A, a parent, I do not believe, or parents cannot refuse to give their child some form of education. As far as the freedom over one's body is concerned, this is not absolute. The use of illicit drugs, the uh, indecent exposure legislation, and as Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Goldberg stated in, uh, in the Griswold case that uh, adultery and fornication are constitutional beyond doubt. <clears throat> are constitutional or you mean laws against them are constitutional? The laws uh, against them are constitutional. Sorry. Now, The, there is nothing in the United States Constitution concerning uh, birth, contraception, or abortion. Now, the appellee does not disagree with the appellant's statement that a woman has a choice. But as we have previously mentioned, we feel that this choice is left up, is, it, is the woman's prior to the time that she becomes pregnant. This is the time of the choice. Now this was brought out in the Rosen versus Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiner's case and in Corky versus Edwards, which are lower court uh, opinions. And my understanding is that, that Corky versus Edwards has been adopted in this court. Has been, yes, Your Honor. I'm, I'm not positive, but I think it has been. Texas doesn't uh, grant any exemption in the case of uh, rape. The woman, their pregnancy has resulted from rape, either statutory or otherwise, has it? There is nothing in our statute about that. Now, the procedure... And such a woman wouldn't have had a choice, would she? Uh, the uh, procedure, and, and I'm, now I'm, I'm telling the court something that's outside the record, but I understand the, the procedure when a woman is brought in after rape is to try to uh, stop whatever has occurred immediately by the proper procedure in, a, in the, um, the hospital immediately she's taken there, if she reports it immediately. But no, there is nothing. <clears throat> now, as I previously informed the court, the statistics well, are the people who prepare the statistics and the different uh, statistics are are not in conformity in connection with the medical aspects of abortion, that is, whether or not it's safer. There are some statistics that will say it is. There are statistics that say it's not. Uh, there have, it has been provided to this court the common law and the legislative history of abortion, and that the, uh, 
the morality of abortion has been injected in various uh, cases and uh, by various groups. Now, we think these matters and the matters of policy should be properly addressed by the state legislature. We think that the uh, consideration should be given uh, to the unborn, and in some instances, a consideration should be given for the father if he would be objective to abortion. Thank you, Your Honor. Floyd, your time is consumed. Unless you have some correction you wish to make, Mrs. Your Honor, I would only like to draw to the court's attention at page 130 of the record the notice of appeal by defendant State of Texas from the judgment of the district court to the Supreme Court of the United States. They have filed an appeal in this court. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Weddington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Floyd. The case is submitted. In a 7-2 to two decision, the court held that a woman's right to an abortion fell within the right to privacy protected by the 14th Amendment. The ruling gave a woman total autonomy over her pregnancy during the first trimester, affecting the abortion laws of 46 states. The court issued its ruling on January 22, 1973. You can read the Roe v. Wade opinion written by Justice Harry Blackman at cspan.org by clicking on America and the Courts. Join us next week for America and the Courts, Saturday evenings at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN. Tonight on American